Let's move on to our second challenge, the fact that so many people use bad visuals. There's actually a good reason why we create bad visuals. That reason is we're writing for two very different audiences. Think about this. What use is made of a typical PowerPoint deck or file after it's been created? Before you answer that question, look up at the top of this in, in the title bar on this slide and notice APP42. That's a signal both to the presenter and to some future reader that on slide 42, there's a fuller explanation of this page. What if you were reading this page on your own after the presentation, perhaps because you missed the presentation, and you're wondering, now what exactly did the presenter have in mind? Well, let's jump to page 42 and we'll find out what he has in mind. The easy way for me to jump from slide 13 to slide 42 is to simply type in 42 enter. Let me do that, 42 enter. And notice I'm now on slide 42. And here we have a detailed explanation of what we were referring to back on slide 13. And notice also at the top of that, up in the title page, it's reminding me that we came from slide 13. So I just wanted to demonstrate that technique. Let's go back. So let's take a look at the different uses made of PowerPoint files. Of course, the most obvious is that they become the presentation visuals to be projected, but they're also a catch-up document for those who missed the presentation. They become a written report or proposal. And in many situations, they become an audit trail or a document of record. These uses are actually quite different in an important way. Let me show you. The first one is different in that, in this case, we've got an audience, might be anywhere from two to 20 people or 100 people, that are reading the visual, making use of it, but none of those audience members are in control of it. So in a presentation, it's the presenter who's controlling the visual, but the people for whom it's intended have no control over it. Look at these other uses. All of these other uses tend to involve one person reading it at a time, and that person is in control of it. Whether they are reading off a printed page, as we see here, or whether they are reading it off a computer screen, they are in control. That's a crucial difference, a crucial difference. The person reading it on their own, of course, doesn't have the presenter available to add detail or explanation. And therefore, it's important that there be enough words or enough detail on the slide so that this solo reader can make sense of it. And we accommodate them by putting all these extra words and extra detail on the slide. Indeed, when we create most of our decks, we know that they're going to be used in part by individual readers. And so we load the slides up with additional explanation. And imagine what that does to the live presentation. Slides designed for individual reading make the live presenter's job much more difficult. So you need to approach this very consciously. You need to keep in mind that you may be creating a deck for two rather different types of audiences. The answer to this little dilemma is to create a note to future users and also to make use of appendix pointers. That will help you serve both audiences well. Here's what we mean by a note to future users. What if this was the very first slide in your deck so that anyone who went to use this deck in the future for any purpose, whether they were using it to make a presentation themselves, whether they were going to now be the presenter, or whether they were simply using it to do some research or remind themselves of what you have said. So this note to future users as the first slide in your deck explains in this example that the first 20 slides were really designed for the live presentation and that slides 21 through 25 should be thought of as an appendix that are available for individual readers using the file later. 
and it's the first slide in the deck and anyone who goes to use this deck will encounter it and they get to read it as slowly as they want. It is not part of a real presentation. So notice how we've now served both audiences. Anybody who needs or wants the deeper dive, we're letting them know it's available and we're telling them exactly where it is. And if they're going to use the deck to support a live presentation that they are making, then we're notifying them that the, those slides are in the front of the deck. And then at the bottom of this note, we add this additional piece of guidance. Some slides in the front of the file will refer to specific pages in the appendix. A notation like this in the title section of a slide, APP 28, will guide you to the appropriate appendix page. We saw an example of that earlier. Let's take one more look at that. This is absolutely key. Let's imagine that I have 10 tips I want to explain for creating and using good visuals. I often show the empty list. In other words, I'll show one through 10 just to let people know right away, I've got a list and this is how long it is. And now let's go through it. But before I do that, notice once again, up in the title section of this slide, it says APP 43 and 44. That's telling a future user that if they want to see a detailed explanation of my slide, they can go to page 43 or slide 43. Let's try that. I'm gonna type in 43 enter and sure enough, here it is on slide 43 and on the next slide 44, here's a fairly detailed explanation of my 10 tips. But if I show a visual like this, it will put people to sleep. And it'll either put them to sleep or it will invite them to read ahead of me. Neither of those things is good. I don't want my audience sleeping and I don't want my audience reading ahead of me. So let's go back, by the way, to slide 18 and notice here in the appendix in the title section of the slide, it's reminding us that we came from slide 18. 